so you want to know the ins and outs of managing your money. Well, lucky for you, you're just in time for another episode of Master Your Finances with certified financial planner professional, Kurt Baker. Kurt and his panel of experts are here for you and will cover topics from a legal and personal standpoint. They'll discuss tax efficiency, liability, owning, managing, and saving your money, and more. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider offers continuing studies programs for adults who need flexibility. Want to add new skills to your resume? Take a continuing studies course at Ryder University. Now, let's learn how we can better change our habits with Kurt Baker. Have you ever heard about large tax credits that large corporations often receive from the government and wondered how they did it? Did you know that these credits are available to all business owners and you may be eligible to receive them? Today, California-based, nationally recognized tax attorney Michael Williams walk you through the process of successfully identifying and obtaining federal, state, and local tax credits you may be eligible for, as well as the top three tax credits currently available, two of which are hidden gems you likely didn't realize you could apply for. Hey, Michael, I appreciate you coming on today, man. It's awesome. I'll call him an all. Yeah, I'm talking all the way from California. So this, is, this is a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. So give us a little background on this. Uh, I know you're uh, a lot of great things happening. I heard you speak not too long ago and uh, a lot of great information that a lot of s- businesses really should be aware of. And hopefully you can help them out and uh, maybe they can get a little money in the, in the mail here in a little while. So give us an idea of what's Absolutely. going on and what's, what this whole thing is about and why small companies don't traditionally uh, think about this stuff. Yeah, it's a really good question. And to your point, tax credits generally are thought of as being something that large Fortune 500 companies are the only eligible for. Now, in my practice, which focuses on tax credits, I find that to be a different case for entrepreneurs. Even if you have as few as 10, 20, 30 employees, it may be worthwhile for your organization to pursue some of these tax credits because they are quite generous. Um, what I what I generally tell people is that the tax code itself is a set of incentives. The government at the federal, state, and local levels have different uh, end goals or end results that they want to achieve. And by incentivizing businesses through the tax code, they can achieve uh, what they're trying to achieve. And so there's a number of tax credits that are available for, for businesses of any size. The ones that I'd like to focus on today would be uh, the employee retention credit, uh, the research and development credit, and then uh, manufacturing credits that are available to companies. Again, these are these are generally available to companies in all 50 states. And so the there's, and each credit is different. Each one requires a different qualification pro, uh, process. Each one is going to have application to different industries. Um, there are specific industries for which these credits uh, are, are focused. But I think one of the large takeaways from the countless conversations I've had with clients is that just because a credit was designed for a certain industry, doesn't mean that other businesses cannot take advantage of those credits. For example, manufacturing credits, you don't have to be producing cars or any other kind of products. Uh, You can get a manufacturing credit for, for, um, for processing materials in a different way. Uh, You can get a research and development credit for coming up with a new process, you know, improving the way that your organization completes a task, you can get an employee retention credit for uh, continuing to retain employees during COVID. So again, I think it's, it is, they're, they're an often misunderstood area of the tax code. And for the most part, it's a niche specialty. So your CPA might be great at doing your tax returns and your financial statements and things on that, that case. But there are so many of these credits, you know, there's hundreds of these credits at the state level. There's a a number at the federal level and there's an infinite there's a number and there's even more at the local level right so you're you're you can't expect your cpa who's more of a generalist to fully grasp or understand or maximize these credits so it's, it's typically a space occupied by um 
by niche practitioners. So but again, it's, it's, it's something that can be driving a ton of, of cash flow to your organization. No, no, that's awesome. So it sounds like the task code, even though it might be labeled like manufacturing credit XYZ, when they actually write the, you know, the actual code itself, it doesn't necessarily carve out and say you must be doing these specific tasks, right? It just says more of a process or, or something like that is what it sounds like, right? So as long as you fit into those, um, the way it's actually written, not necessarily the title of it, right? So you have to pay a lot more attention to the, the text of the actual tax credit, which is what you do as an expert. You come in and you say, hey, these, th this verbiage actually can apply to other industries in different ways, which is really important, right? Because you read it and you're like, oh, well, that's not me. Uh, but it might be, right? If you actually dig into it and understand it a little bit better. And that's where you come in, I guess, right? Exactly. So for just two quick examples, for manufacturing credit, um, I was able to help a tree removal company, which, you know, it's just think about it. Someone comes in, removes trees from your home or your business, or sometimes they work with utility companies. And this tree company was, was taking the trees. They were making, they were turning the trees into wood chips, and they were using those wood chips for a variety of applications, either erosion control or mulch or even some biomass energy. And so because those trees were processed in such a way that fit the description of the state specific tax code, we were able to obtain a, 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 large, a high six figure tax credit for this tree services company. And obviously when you see a tree removal company, you don't think manufacturer, but again, you have to, you have to understand how the language of the code is written and then make a determination of whether your business fits. Similarly, um, I worked for a professional services company the, that, that was designing an internal software that uh, was applicable to its sales function. Now, this is not a tech company. It's a brick and mortar. They have, you know, they sell consulting services, but the technology that it designed internally was eligible for a research and development credit, again, mid six figures, because the R&D tax credit state that if it's designed for taxpayers who design, develop, or improve products, processes, techniques, formulas, or software. Um, I'm working on another R&D credit right now for a food seasoning company mm. that is uh, experimenting with a variety of hot sauce formulations, right? So they mm. are, they spend a lot of time, they actually have a fascinating company they have scientists and lab coats who are mixing certain chemical compounds together and we're working on obtaining a research and development credit for that particular company again not you think of research and development you think of silicon valley um and companies like google and amazon and others like sure. that but you're the companies down the street from you can probably qualify for research and development credit and again these are significant six sometimes seven figure wow um Credits and refunds your company can them. Now, now, if I'm a, if I go back to your tree company, let's say I'm a tree company and, and I'm out there chopping down trees. And is there a way for me to know ahead of time that hey, if we take these trees and we turn them into mulch and we use them for a certain purpose, that hey, we, maybe we can get a credit down the road. It might make sense for us to you know change our process a little bit to be able to qualify for some of these credits um, before we go out and start cutting the trees down. Is there a way to become a little more educated about like what you could? set yourself up to qualify for later? Because most of them, honestly, probably don't think about it, right? Because they're just out doing their job for the most part. Yeah, of course. And again, when these, you have to think about the incentives and so many manufacturing jobs have left the U.S. Hmm. Uh, in the last few decades that there is a focus on a lot, from a lot of state legislatures on, um, on, on advertising that they are bringing manufacturing jobs to their state right now again these this particular company to your point they reformulated the way they cut down the trees mm. they they implemented a more mechanized process so they were using a lot more machinery rather than manpower to um to turn those trees into wood chips um but in theory even if you had uh less mechanization and more manpower because you are again turning that tree into those wood chips it's a separate and distinct product you can fall under the manufacturing credits 
uh, of various states. Now, again, every state's going to be a little bit different. Not mm-hmm. all the codes are the same, but it's uh, generally you can find a, a lot of information by doing a quick Google search and then contacting uh, a tax credit expert who can guide you through the process and who can really dig into the language uh, of each uh, tax code for each state or if there's a federal opportunity as well to make a determination of whether or not you qualify. Now, again, I think you have to be able to make a, a, a great case to qualify. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that every business is going to be able to qualify these credits because they're not. However, right. if you take a look from a slightly different perspective at what your business actually does, there's a lot of credit opportunities out there. Wow, that's just in, that's just incredible. So, um, so what are you seeing out there now? I mean, uh, you, you got some examples of some things that uh, we can touch on a little bit. We're going to take a break here in about a minute or so. But yeah, just give us, give us kind of a summary of the, the three items that, again that we're uh, we're seeing out there right now that are in the forefront. Of course. So I think in the one that I'd like to spend some significant time on today is the employee retention credit. It is the widest reaching and one of the most generous tax credits that I've seen in my career. Um, so I'd like to spend some time talking about that because I think it can touch uh, so many companies. Um, and then we can dig in a little bit further on the others that I talk about um, regarding the research and development credits and the manufacturing credits. Now, again, we're not limited and the universe of tax credits is not limited to those three items. Those are just three of the more popular ones. Right. Um, for example, again, talking about incentives, the state of Virgi- Virginia has a tax credit for um, companies that sort of wine, like wine vineyards in their state, mm-hmm. you know, because Virginia apparently wants to compete with my home state of California and uh, the wine game. They probably have a long way to go. Uh, right. to get there, but they, they, they are implementing tax credits in order to incentivize companies to, to relocate there and, and develop um, certain vineyards in that area. So again, it's, it's all about incentives, it's all about what the state or local or federal, um, uh, uh, basically what, they, what they're trying to achieve. Excellent. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get dig into the employee uh, retention credits that uh, Michael was talking about. You listen to Master Your Finance. We'll be right back. This is Master Your Finances with Kurt Baker, Certified Financial Planner Professional. Learn about tax efficiency, liability, owning, managing, and saving your money and more from Kurt and his experienced panel of guests. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider University offers flexible education for adult learners. For more information, it's rider.edu slash next step. Uh, welcome back. Here I'm here with uh, Michael Williams, and we're going to talk about the employee retention credit. Mike, you want to, Michael, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, so again, as I mentioned before the break, this is one of the more lucrative uh, and generous credits that is as far ranging of a tax credit as I've seen in my career. Um, I'm going to refer to it as the ERC, the Employee Retention Credit Route. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so this is what's called a refundable tax credit created as part of the CARES Act in 2020. And the incentive here was to encourage employers to keep their employees on payroll during COVID, right? So the the ERC was originally slated to uh, be in place from mid-March 2020 through the end of 2021. And again, the incentive here was that the federal government wanted employers to retain employees. The incentive is right in the nave. It's the employee retention credit. Mm -hmm. Now, subsequent to the original release, the fourth quarter of 2021 was uh, eliminated from eligibility purposes, but this credit is still available for companies um, who employed uh, employees from March 13th, 2020 through the end of September, 2021. Now, uh, this is couple of quick facts to know about this because the rules have changed a number of times. There's a lot of misunderstanding about the credit. Um, up until about a month ago, if you had done a Google search with the question, can I receive the ERC if I received a PPP loan? The first answer that Google would provide straight from the IRS website was no, you could not. And that's wrong because that changed 
in the third quarter of 2021 so that companies who obtained a PPP loan can also obtain the ERC. Even if you obtain two PPP loans, you can do it. You can obtain the ERC if you qualify for the ERC. Again, just a common misunderstanding that a lot of entrepreneurs um, are, are, are confused by. So how do I obtain the ERC if I'm a business owner? So you have to meet one of two tests to be eligible for the credit. You either have to have a significant decline in gross receipts and revenues during a specific calendar quarter for 2021 or 2020, or you have to have what's called a fully or partially suspended operation due to federal, state, or local government orders, um, which limit your business operations. I think a classic example here is the restaurant industry. So I live in Los Angeles and indoor dining was significantly restricted from the beginning of March, 2020, pretty much throughout that period of time to the end of June, 2021. So a very, very long period of time, restaurants in Los Angeles and in other parts of California and a lot of other parts of the country could not serve patrons indoors or they had to reduce the amount of customers they served indoors so if you think about it this way what's a partial shutdown to qualify me for this credit it is if i used to serve 100 people indoors i have some outdoor dining i have a delivery service i do takeout if during any period during um again march 13 2020 through the end of september 2021 if i could only serve 80 people indoors instead of my normal 100, the IRS can consider that a partial shutdown, which can qualify your business for this credit. Now, again, not everyone who's listening to this is going to own a restaurant. And the IRS, unfortunately, has not provided guidance on every specific industry to which this could apply. However, as a, someone like myself would take this example that they have provided regarding restaurants, you kind of make an analogy to other industries, right? So you think about the ones most affected by COVID. You have bars, you have gyms, you have a lot of industries that have been affected by COVID in one or more ways. And again, that's just leaving aside the revenue reduction part of that test. And you only have to hit one of those tests in order to qualify. Now, what if the you? I'm, reason, yeah, go, I'm going to interrupt you, but what, what about some of these that do the extreme? I mean, I know a gym owner in, in New York that ended up shutting down, closing, and coming to New Jersey to work for somebody. So he literally had to close his business after about six months. He couldn't hold it anymore. Um, yeah, is he still eligible to go back in and see if maybe he can recoup some of those costs that because that was a significant loss for him? Obviously, he ended up going out of even, business. Yeah. Even businesses that have closed during COVID can go back and obtain the credit. And I, what I haven't said is, is how much the credit can be. Okay. And this is the reason why I think it's so important for every entrepreneur to take a look at this is if you can qualify your business for this credit, you can obtain a refund check from the IRS, or it's actually it's a series of checks, but the maximum credit opportunity is $26,000 per employee. Wow. So the math on this adds up very quickly. So, for example, if you had 10 employees, your maximum opportunity is $260,000. If you have 100 employees, your maximum credit opportunity is $2.6 million. And again, this is why this credit, um, it just adds up so very quickly um, for even m- uh, small or mid-sized companies. And if you're a big company, um, the credit adds up very quickly. Well, so I, be, again, I think yeah, it's com- companies of any size, any geographic location, because this is a federally, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a credit that's administered by the IRS. Uh, this is something that every entrepreneur needs to take a look at. So it sounds like if they've, if they've gotten a PPP loan or two, and they have at least a few employees, it could be even small, right? I mean, if it's $26,000 per employee, if you're small, I mean, we have a nonprofit, a nonprofit that has a couple of employees, I mean, that could be fifty to one hundred thousand dollars, easy, right? Exactly, and a lot yeah. and a lot yeah. of times, what I see is that the credits for the smaller organizations are actually more meaningful right. to the than the large organizations because they have less access to capital, 
They have less of an ability to, to get funding from various sources. They often operate on thinner margins. So, you know, a $100,000 credit for someone who has four employees might be more meaningful than a million dollar credit for someone who has 40 employees, mm -hmm. you know? So I think it's, and again, this is, and you bring up a good point. Uh, the, the qualifications are pretty broad for profit and nonprofit companies can qualify. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have a charity organization, if you have um, a school, uh, you know, a private school or a, or a, or a, uh, a charter school, those can potentially qualify for this credit. There are some additional rules around those organizations. Um, and, and so, but, but again, because again, these are somewhat complex rules that right. are often misunderstood, but I think the point that I'm trying to make is it is, and uh, this credit can be applied to an incredibly broad set of industries and it can be obtained from people living in Florida, New York, California, Alaska, Hawaii, like wherever you are in the U.S., even some of the territories, so even Puerto Rico, potentially qualify for the credit. This sounds like almost every business should be looking at this. How do, I'm curious about how this, uh, if you had to restructure your business, um, I know a lot of people started working remotely um, mm -hmm. and things like that. So how, how does that affect, um, if, if you can explain it, it might be too complicated to explain uh, generally, but does that affect it too? Like, let's say my employees came in five days a week and now they're literally working completely virtual or maybe they come in once a week or once every, I mean, one company that the lady, she went in once a month to pick up the mail and everybody else was working remotely when and before that they all went into the office every day. It's a really good question. So just take me for example, I'm a tax attorney, mm -hmm. right? So I can do my job pretty much as well as I, you know, if I'm in an office or if I'm working remotely. So there's not really a significant impact to mm. my firm by going remotely. However, even someone in my industry, in law, if you're a trial attorney, courts were shut down in various right. jurisdictions. You couldn't get a trial, you couldn't get a hearing date. A lot of attorneys who are in a courtroom every day could no longer go to the courtroom. Cases had a, that usually took a year to settle, they would take three, they're not taking three years to settle. Those are significant impacts. So even within certain industries, there's subsets of companies that may or may not qualify based on their unique facts and circumstances. Now, well, again, if you are- Yeah, builder just came to mind for me. What if I'm a builder and I can, my supply chain issue, right? Like I can't get a garage door for six months, but so I have to reduce or slow down my production, not necessarily stop, but I have to slow it, right? Because I'm having trouble real, because of other ramifications. Really Exactly. And, you know, again, living in Los Angeles, I, you know, if you look out your window, the port of Long Beach had at one point over 100 container ships uh, waiting to, to dock and unload their cargo. So we had massive supply chain issues, specifically in 2021 during this period. So um, I have qualified certain construction companies who had significant supply chain issues. The other part about construction or other similarly situ situated companies is they require the government to specifically local municipalities to permit their work in, in most cases. So a lot of those municipal offices were closed. They weren't issuing permits or they would go from taking seven days to seven months to process permits, which really slowed down the building process in, in various types of construction, right? So I think there's, and this is why you have to do, you want to do mo both of a quantitative and a qualitative analysis. What I mean by that is take a look at the business impact. If someone doubled their revenue and doubled their profits, they may not be a good candidate for this credit. Um, but if they, you know, if a, if a company was to experience these significant supply chain issues and they couldn't get a government official to sign off on the work or things of this nature, that's a qualitative analysis that you have to do as part of the eligibility um, criteria in order to see if a company qualifies, right? So it's it's something that, so just as an example, every client that I talk to, I speak to them initially for 30 to 60 minutes, just to ask them about their business. What were the effects? What were the effects on revenue? What was the effects on headcount? Were you limited in any way? You know, what were the limitations? Because you really want to dig in to do um, to do some due diligence to ensure that you are 
filing a claim that can be approved by the IRS, but also it's it's oftentimes I start those calls thinking that this industry is probably not a good candidate. And by the end of the call, the entrepreneur that I'm talking to just has a hundred examples of how they were restricted. Right. Wow. And I think that's it. That's why it's really important to hear the stories of the entrepreneurs because they felt the brunt of the pain from these uh, governmental shutdowns and restrictions. Absolutely, Michael. Yeah, we're going to take another quick break, and we're getting some more examples of uh, many of us that are out there that probably qualify for these credits, and we should learn a little bit more about it. Listen to Master Your Finance. We'll be right back. This is Master Your Finances with Kurt Baker, certified financial planner professional. Learn about tax efficiency, liability, owning, managing, and saving your money and more from Kurt and his experienced panel of guests. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider University offers flexible education for adult learners. For more information, it's rider.edu slash next step. Hi, Michael. I appreciate everything here. We're going to get uh, some. You had some great examples of the employer retention credit, the uh, what you call the ERC, right? Uh, I'm going to give us some more examples of people that might qualify for it. And I know um, they might want to get right on this, right? There's some reasons they might want to get moving if they think they might qualify. Absolutely. So just to to go over some industries that could qualify, we talked about restaurants, talked about bars, talked about gyms, talked about construction companies, medical offices were another one that oh, yeah. had significant effects. You know, a lot of surgeons or uh, or also dentists could not do elective procedures for a significant period of time. So that's one where, uh, that's one type of industry, either medicine or dentistry, uh, that had, you know, they could they had a restriction on a number of people that could sit in the waiting rooms. They had, they could not do elective procedures for a period of time. They had significant supply chain issues, even the imprints that dentists use to do moldings for orthodontics or um, certain implementations uh, for people's dental work. They, they couldn't get some of those products. It's a story that I hear pretty frequently. Um, so, again, those are kind of some of the restrictions that can qualify um, a business for for the credit. Other ones. You know, again, we could go down a list, but I, I, I think prop, sometimes property management companies can qualify. Uh, actually, it was a really good example. A real estate brokerage that I helped qualify at the end of 2021, the state of California and other states followed suit. Uh, real estate brokerage, res- they did residential real estate, and the state of California said you could not hold open houses during parts of the pandemic. Mm. And so that is a material restriction that went all virtual. You know, you had to ask a question, a great question before about what can you do going virtual? Now, anyone who's listening, who's bought a home previously, it's real hard to get a great feel for the home by looking at it virtually. You want to get in, you want to, he- you know, you want to, you know, you want to touch things, you want to walk it, you want to hear how much noise is coming from the street. You can't replicate those things virtually. And because the state of California restricted the ability to do open houses, that's a governmental restriction that 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 was able, that we were able to qualify this company for, and they got a high six-figure um, credit. And again, when I say credit, it's called a credit, but it ends up being a cash payment um, to to these entrepreneurs. Um, you know, there's a, there's other ones electrical contractors who couldn't get supplies, couldn't get permits, um, you know, food service companies, the distributors for some of these restaurants, they couldn't get certain types of liquors, they couldn't get certain types of foods. You know, anyone that experienced significant supply chain disruption could be um, could be a good candidate. And I can go on down this industry list for a long time. Now, now aren't they, the, the, these are government the, programs, right? So government programs usually have a, a sunset or an end date of some kind, right? So how short, how much time do people have to think about all this stuff? It's a great question. So the there's two answers here. The official answer is that you can obtain a refund. You can make a refund claim as long as this, what's called the statute of limitations is open on filing an amended payroll tax return. Now, the statute of limitations means you have a finite period of time to amend your return. In this case, it's generally three years. 
from the date you filed the return. So this program will officially um, start to um, phase out starting next year. That's the official answer. The other thing we have to look at is what has happened to CARES Act programs historically. The PPP shut down early without warning. The second largest program, which is the EIDL, the Economic Industry Disaster Injury Disaster Loan, um, shut down early without warning. They've already cut down one quarter of eligibility for the ERC. So I have I have some contacts. They're pretty close to the legislative piece of the ERC, and most of those people believe that the opportunity to obtain this credit is likely to go away towards the end of this year. Now, there's nothing official that's been said about that, but the people that I trust to be in the know about this sort of thing says that there's probably maybe six more months where entrepreneurs will have the opportunity to file these claims before the, uh, the ERC uh, essentially shuts down. So I think the 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 point I'm making is that entrepreneurs should look at this credit, they should look at it now, and they should determine their eligibility uh, now. And if they can qualify for one, two, three, four, five, six of the quarters that are eligible for the credit, they should try to get those claims in before the program shuts down. Now, is this a situation where like almost every entrepreneur should say, hey, look, I need to contact the tax attorney? Is there something that maybe they could do as kind of a, a quick pre-qualifier to themselves and say, hey, if I meet, you know, I don't know, the quarter over quarter. I mean, what are some, like, because I know everybody's busy out there. It's an entrepreneur. I'm just trying to give them a couple of quick bullet points. Like, if, if you meet any of these requirements, how do we make it easy on them to say, hey, let's turn it over. Maybe my account can send something to, my, to the tax attorney, or maybe somebody can yeah. compile this information so I can just get this check uh, without having to spend, you know, the next week figuring it all out on my own. I, I mean, how do they get it? Because I know people are busy that are entrepreneurs, and they're like, look, this sounds great, but how am I going to get all this done? I totally, totally understand. I uh, totally understand it's hard to get entrepreneurs have enough enough headaches trying to just run their business on a day-to-day mm-hmm. basis. What I generally tell people is everyone should have 30 minutes okay. to discuss a credit that could be worth a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, a million dollars to them. Okay. Um, so I, while there are things that entrepreneurs can do to prepare themselves and research this. I think, I think the talking with an expert okay. for, for 30 minutes is really the advice I would want to give because, you know, you can research this thing all day long and you're as an entrepreneur, if you're not a, a tax attorney and specifically not a, a tax attorney who focuses on credits, right. Um, your head's going to be spinning with all the information that's out there. So for me, there's actually generally a four step process okay. to how I would manage this. So I can walk through that here just real quickly. So I, again, I like conducting an, an analysis on the phone with an entrepreneur first as a mm-hmm. first step, because I can sort out within 30 minutes or so, whether or not there's a good opportunity for that entrepreneur to qualify after the call is over. If we think it's a good, there's a good eligibility uh, opportunity. And again, not everyone's going to qualify, but I think that it's worth the 30 minutes to make that determination. Um, I generally ask, I send a very brief uh, document request by email. Um, it's, It's just three reports that your bookkeeper or your CPA can provide. It should take them about 30 more minutes to obtain those things. I review the information and then conduct a follow-up um, call to, to with the analysis with the entrepreneur. And we can kind of go over whether or not they can qualify and what the magnitude of that credit is. So the total time that it takes for the entrepreneur is somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes. So I try to make it as easy as possible given their often hectic schedules. Right. And again, the credits that I'm seeing are significant. I filed um, a couple of eight-figure credits, so over $10 million, um, a number of seven-figure credits, and uh, even more six-figure credits. So it's, it's again, the numbers are significant for those who can qualify. Not everyone will qualify. However, if you can, it's a significant opportunity. Okay. Well, that's that's good to know because I know everybody, you know, they hear these things like, wow, but I don't have the time to figure this all out. But if you're just saying it's 60 to 90 minutes, I'm pretty sure most people can carve that out and say, hey, let me just figure it out. If it's not, if it's a no-go, fine. At least I know. If it is a go, 
and again, I mean, this is just one of those things that rarely do I say this to people. This is something you need to really kind of get on <laughs> because it, yeah. we don't know. I mean, the government's, you know, always very unpredictable in what they're doing because there's a lot of political elements to this that none of us really control. There's one day they're going to wake up and say, this is what we think is the best thing to do. And boom, it happens. And you're like, oh, what happened? Wait a minute. Um, so you kind of go strike while the iron's hot, so to speak, in this case, right? I think that's right. You know, tax credits in general are one of the first things to be removed. Mm -hmm. in any kind of tax legislation so you know for example the r d credit gets renewed every so free, every so often every every few years the employee retention credit which has already been reduced in terms of the time period you can qualify for my expectation is that this is the kind of credit especially given some of the broader economic concerns that the federal government has regarding inflation and those mm -hmm. kinds of things my guess is that um, this program will end early. How early? I, I mean, I'm not. I don't think it's going to end tomorrow, but it's possible. But I think it. I think that we have probably till the end of this year. But with that said, I would caution entrepreneurs from ignoring this for much longer because you want to be able to 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 make sure that you can file a claim. Because the, the last thing you want to happen is to figure out the day after the program ends that you were eligible and that you could have received this kind of funding. Right, because if I, if I theoretically, let's say I go through this process and I figure out whether or not I qualify, um, as long as I get my application submitted, I mean, if I submitted it, you know, in two weeks and then, in, in, you know, and then three weeks they cancel the program out, they're not going to cancel my application traditionally, right? Do they, I mean, they can do whatever they want, but traditionally have they done that where they're saying, hey, you know, retroactively we're going to kill this program? Does that happen very often? No. To yeah. your point, you know, neither you nor I have right. control over the federal government. Of course not. But yeah. the but the traditionally, as long as you have your application in mm -hmm. before the program closes, they will honor that. So again, that's good. why I encourage entrepreneurs to uh, to take a real good look. And again, it's a it's it's just to figure out the eligibility piece. It's probably worth a thirty minute phone call. Just to make that determination, then, right. and then if you and if that, that determination gets made, then um, it might be sixty more minutes, and then and then you can file a claim, and and it's a uh, you know it's pretty straightforward. It, it to be honest, it almost sounds too good to be true, right? Which is what a lot of entrepreneurs have told me, and and especially when you're yeah. talking with an attorney sometimes, and they tell you something that sounds too good to be true, you get skeptical. I totally understand that, but you know, in this case, I have seen a number of clients get some substantial refund checks um so it's a it's a it's just an amazing opportunity and and that's why yeah. i would like to evangelize it to as many entrepreneurs uh, oh i as agree and, and and you're pointing out we're gonna take a quick break but i but i mean the key is really to go somebody has a good you know that it's reputable locally whoever you know is great if, if they're expert in this area which is really the, the tax credits uh, and they have a good reputation. Awesome. I mean, obviously you do, but but that's the key too. Because a lot of scams out there. So we want to make sure you don't fall into one of these boats where somebody's soliciting you for something that's actually not valid, and you and you, know, you do some funky things, and you don't want to do that. But we're we're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back. You listen to Master Your Finances. This is Master Your Finances with Kurt Baker, certified financial planner professional. Learn about tax efficiency, liability, owning, managing, and saving your money and more from Kurt and his experienced panel of guests. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider University offers flexible education for adult learners. For more information, it's rider.edu slash next step. Uh, welcome back. You're listening to uh, Michael Williams uh, talk about uh, tax credits. Uh, so, Michael, I know uh, this uh, employee retention credit, the ERC, is probably one of the biggest programs you've seen, it sounds like. And um, it's tied into the PPP. And a lot of people don't realize they qualify. They got the PPP loans. I remember when we applied for it for our little nonprofit that we thought these other things, we just, we just couldn't do. We really couldn't do anything else if we got the PPP loans. But it sounds like that's opened up and in, and in a very big way with a very short potential timeline on it. Um, and regardless, you, if you want to get the check if you're eligible, right? So you might as well go out and get it. Um, so want to tell us a little bit more about that because I know it's a, a big deal and uh, it's important to talk to somebody who's actually dealt in tax credits through their career that didn't just pop up to do this because it, it sounds like something fun to do all of a sudden. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, the, that's the case with a lot of, you know, when, when some lucrative tax credit comes up, you'll often see some people, you know, trying to get educated on it. Um, and, and more often than not, some of those people just, they, they don't, 
they're not serving their clients' best interest um, if they're trying to learn on the fly, you know, because mm-hmm. tax credits are, are a specialty. Um, and usually, you know, high quality, I used to work at Ernst & Young, it's a big four accounting firm. You see a lot of tax credit professionals at firms that are that size, a global tax firm. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the regional and local CPA offices or, um, or law firms just don't have that level of expertise. That's, that's okay. But what I'm saying is, is that you really want to work with someone who knows every aspect of these particular credits. Um, one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs have, when they start to come, when we start the conversation, they say, you know, I'm afraid my CPA is going to get upset with me for having this conversation. I said, I would love to talk to your CPA because I try to create a collaborative environment with those CPAs Mm -hmm. rather than a competitive one, right? I think that they, if they can get involved with this program, a lot of them aren't going to want to, the really good ones that know what they're good at and what they need to outsource are excellent to work with, right? And Mm -hmm. I think that that collaborative effort can really lead to a positive result for a client because the CPA has all the history of the client and they want to do what's right for the client. So they want to bring in an expert um, to help maximize the benefit. The, the I, I have seen CPAs get a little territorial from time to time. Um, and I've reviewed the work that they've done to try when they're trying to do these credits for the clients. They're often missing it by 25 or 30 percent wow um which is a real disservice to the clients and look they're not trying to do anything wrong it's just they don't fully understand the credit and they make mistakes and they're not maximizing the credit or they're doing something that can potentially trigger an audit for the client and no entrepreneur that i know wants an unnecessary visit from the irs right so definitely not um <laughs> that is like one of the things that can go wrong Mm. When is whenever you're making a refund claim for any tax credit, it doesn't matter if it's manufacturing credit, R and D, ERC, whatever. If you if you're trying to open up a vineyard in Virginia, like we talked about before, like whenever you're doing these things, they're always subject to audit. And if you don't have an expert in your corner who has who has been a part of IRS audits previously you have the highly high likelihood of getting steamrolled by IRS, mm-hmm. right? So I think that's that's a, a situation that most entrepreneurs want to avoid. So it's, for example, as part of all of my engagements, um, I, uh, I provide audit representation for a client in the, in, in the event that they do get audited. So that's a somewhat of a differentiator for me as opposed to what I see in the market, but I want to stand behind all of the credits claims that I file, right? I want the client to feel like they have someone in their corner that can, that can uh, advocate for them if the IRS comes calling. Right. So I think that's really important to have an experienced person who has dealt with many audits Um uh, in the event, in the event that these plans get audited, and, and I agree, with, I'm going to reemphasize that because not all accountants are enrolled agents are able to represent in front of the IRS either. So even if your accountant is mm-hmm. going to take this on, that's that's a higher level, and and they have not only have to be qual- able to, they have to be doing it because it's it's definitely a skill um, that I've learned mm-hmm. through the years by talking to different you know CPAs that do this. Um, they tend to be a specialty even among that community itself. Um, the ones that do represent in front of the IRS. Um, mm-hmm. So having That's an attorney true. that does that as well, um, I just want to you know, reemphasize that because I've seen that through my career where people who are used to you know working with the IRS and explaining things to them correctly because they talk their own language over there, right? They have their own way of looking at things, and you have to really talk the way they do and explain things that you know that, that it, it's really a specialty. It's definitely, it's a specialty. That's right. And the worst thing for an entrepreneur is to get themselves into an audit and again like the i don't expect an entrepreneur to have a a full understanding of the tax code that's why that's why people like myself have gotten into this line of work so we can help entrepreneurs navigate those complicated waters but if you have someone who is inexperienced um, with those matters the entrepreneur gets dragged in um and it just it becomes a real nightmare and again we Mm -hmm. talked before about does an entrepreneur have 30 minutes to have a phone call that could 
the end result would be a million dollar check. At the flip side of that, does the entrepreneur have weeks or months or uh, even longer to go through an audit that is unfavorable to that entrepreneur, right. right? So I think that is where that ounce of prevention on the front end should resolve the, whatever pound of cure is necessary in the event of an audit. Because again, all of these claims, and I feel every claim that I file, I want to stand by, um, and I do, and that's why I provide that audit representation as part of my engagements. But I also want to take that kind of pressure off of the entrepreneur in those situations because I want I want them to have the best possible advocate um, to to defend those claims. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you get the whole package, so to speak. You know, so um, yeah. that that is fantastic. Um, so if I go ahead and apply for one of these things, and let's say let's assume we're hopefully successful, what's the timeline typically that this takes for this whole thing to get processed and for me to see something if if we're successful? This is a really great question, um, and this is something that every entrepreneur asks. The What I'm seeing in the market is somewhere between four and six months. Now, I'm okay. going to caveat that because I, I, I'm, I, that time period was based on claims. So I, I had two clients receive checks last week um, for claims that we filed in the last week of January. However, as the IRS goes further and further into ex what we call extended tax season, so you know, if, if companies or individuals extended their tax returns, they are now filing those tax returns that the IRS has to review. There's a massive backlog of tax returns of all varieties that the IRS is working through right now. You know, they spent a lot of time talking about an organization that struggled to work remotely. The IRS, in large, in a, in a large part, work remotely during portions of COVID, so that helped to create this massive backlog. So while right now I'm seeing four to six months um, in the market, I, I expect to see that time lag for processing increase okay. as we move forward in time. So my, again, my recommendation is that entrepreneurs look at this credit opportunity um, now or in the very, very near future, because the longer they wait, the more, the, there's two things gonna happen. The more likely it is the program will shut down, and also the longer it's gonna take for those claims to process. Um, but again, I think it's right now four to six months, but I, I expect that to increase as we move forward in time. Yeah, we definitely hear that. So, um, and, and we got a couple of minutes left. Do you wanna uh, kind of summarize? We went through a lot of different aspects of uh, these tax credits. I know there's, you're talking about three primary ones, but there's a lot of different ones out there that people may be qualifying for. Um, so you wanna kind of put all that back together for us, if you don't mind, and uh, I appreciate it very much. Yeah, no, of course. So just, and again, just to reiterate a few things. Number one, the tax code is just a set of incentives that tries to motivate entrepreneurs to behave in certain ways, right? There's there's ones that we didn't talk about. There's certain tax credits for uh, uh, putting a business or locating a business in certain geographic areas. Oftentimes those are historically um, socioeconomically depressed areas um, where city or state governments want to improve the livelihood of the, the neighborhood and the residents of that neighborhood. And so they'll encourage businesses to move in there and they will provide tax credits. Again, there are too many tax credits that even if we did this um, every day for the next month, um, have these conversations, we couldn't go off through all of mm -hmm. them, right? So I think it's it's thinking as uh, if I'm putting myself in a CEO seat, I'm thinking about where my company is located, what my company does, and whether or not I'm providing a service or product that um, the government has or wants to incentivize, right? So that's kind of a starting point. Then I would say, talk to a C talk to your local CPA. Um, if that CPA does not work in credits or they don't have any experience with that, have them connect with someone who does, right? So I, again, I collaborate with a number of CPA firms, both at the local, regional, and national level who, um, who don't focus on some of these credits, but they want to be able to provide and drive value to their clients and so they engage with someone like myself to, who has an expertise in these credits to, um, to, to, to bring those to their clients and be able to explain those credits, which are often very complicated in ways that they can understand, you know, calculate the magnitude of the credit, 
uh, ensure that it makes sense for the entrepreneur, and then you go from there. But again, I think it's I think that if I'm if I'm any kind of business owner, there's likely some sort of credit out there that I can take advantage of. It's just about how much it is, and whether or not I can identify it. Um, I can identify it from myself and my business. But because a lot of the credits are so lucrative, it's really worth the time to just take a step back and and try to identify those opportunities as they arise. And the ones we talked about today, just real briefly, the R&D credits, the manufacturing credits, and, and the one that, again, I want to reiterate that every entrepreneur in every state across the country should be looking at is this employee retention credit because it's it's one that will is go, is likely going to go away faster than the others. So and it's and it's a very very um, generous and lucrative credit for entrepreneurs that can provide them with cash flow that they may need in the wake of uh, this pandemic recovery. Awesome, Michael. We really appreciate you coming on. Uh, and once again, yeah, the big ones are um, the R. Lots of tax credits out there, as you mentioned. Um, the three that he talked about today, the R&D credits and manufacturing credits, you don't necessarily have to think of yourself as one of those firms. The employee retention credit, which is the ERC, is the big one. Uh, everybody really should be at least taking a quick look at that. And uh, uh, obviously, reach out to a local expert if you have one or somebody you already trust. Um, if you need to talk to Michael, you can reach him by going to cfomw.com. He'd be happy to set up a, an appointment with you and go over it if you don't have anybody locally to help you out. Uh, you've been listening to Master Your Finances. Have a great day. That was this week's episode of Master Your Finances with Kurt Baker, certified financial planner professional. Tune in every Sunday at 9 a.m. to expand your knowledge in building and managing your wealth. Missed an episode? No worries. You can subscribe to a free weekly episode of Master Your Finances to listen to on your favorite podcasting platform. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever. Master Your Finances is underwritten in part by Certified Wealth Management and Investment and Rider University. Rider offers continuing studies programs for adults who need flexibility. Want to add new skills to your resume? Take a continuing studies course at Rider University.